On July 17, 1981, one of the worst structural disasters of a building occurred at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. This disaster killed 114 people and injured over 200 others. The collapse involved inadequately designed and constructed hanging walkways. These walkways were filled with dancers and overhung several hundred people that were on the lobby floor at the dance. I was a junior in high school at the time living in a suburb of Kansas City. Shortly thereafter, I would attend engineering school. To say that this disaster had a deep and lasting effect on the people of Kansas City would be a vast understatement. You'd hear stories about people who had either known people who were there or there themselves who had been involved in the construction of the Hyatt Hotel. I performed construction inspection services the summer before I graduated engineering school at an Air Force base in the Kansas City area. This was five years after the collapse of the Skywalks. I had met a worker who had indicated that he had installed drywall along the Skywalks. He said he didn't have a good feeling about the safety or the stability of those Skywalks as he hung the drywall. In fact, he said he was nervous the entire time he was working on them. Even though it was well outside his scope to discover anything wrong with the Skywalks design or construction, you definitely got the sense that there were feelings of guilt associated with his involvement in the project. The reason I'm making this video is to bring attention to some key aspects of the disaster, which hasn't until recently received much focus. My name is Casey Jones. I run my own geotechnical engineering firm based in the Kansas City area. As a rule, when I do my research for these videos, I try to be objective and fact-based. But I'll explain what made me so angry about the involvement of Hallmark Corporation relative to the Hyatt Regency disaster as reported in some of these recently published books. The lessons for engineers and building officials came relatively quickly following the collapse of the Hyatt Skywalks. The Hyatt disaster and the events surrounding it have become a staple of engineering ethics classes since then. Most people are familiar with the lead structural engineers on the project who had a design contract with Hallmark Redevelopment Corporation for the design of the Hyatt Hotel. These engineers included firm owner Jack Gillum and his lead engineer Daniel Duncan. The failure of the fourth and second floor pedestrian walkways, or skywalks as they were called, was attributed to the pullout of the anchor rods from the box beams embedded in the floor of the skywalks. The steel fabricator Haven Steel reportedly phoned Daniel Duncan to request a change from six rods to 12 in order to avoid having to thread the rods full length between two levels of skywalks. This change approved by Duncan resulted in doubling of the loads being carried by the nets connected to the box beam and the skywalks, which was not realized at the time. The steel fabricator assumed that the structural engineer had or would perform design calculations to verify the feasibility of this new connection design. This never happened. The structural engineer, for his part, assumed that the steel fabricator, who had engineers on their staff, would design the relevant details for a suitable box beam and rod connection, but they didn't perform this check either. The result was that the connections to the walkway were highly overstressed and a collapse would simply be a matter of time. Both Gillum and Duncan lost their licenses to practice engineering in the state of Missouri. Gillum and Duncan were no doubt racked with guilt about what happened and Duncan disappeared from the public eye. It took several years for Gillum to modify his earlier position that others were ultimately responsible for the disaster. He later took full responsibility for the disaster as it was his engineering firm and he was the engineer of record for the structural design of the Hyatt Hotel. Jack. Uh, there's been a collapse at the Hyatt. Um, I just was dumbfounded. I mean, it was just like a something hitting you in as hard as it can in your stomach. As an engineer of record, you take the full responsibility, and that's what I did. I sealed the drawing, and that's what where the buck stopped, and that's where it will on every single project. At the time of the collapse, the contract for the structural design of the Hyatt Regency Hotel by Gillum's firm was worth over $250,000, but this represented a relatively small percentage of his firm-wide annual revenue of $22 million. Jack Gillum died in 2012, but in the last years of his life, he talked to many engineers at schools and conferences to admit his errors with the Hyatt Regency Hotel design and construction, and to strongly encourage other engineers to avoid making similar mistakes in their engineering practice. It turned out that the strongest actions taken as a result of the tragedy were limited to the loss of Gillum's and Duncan's engineering licenses and the ruin of Gillum's engineering firm. Nobody was found to be criminally liable and nobody else was held to account except to make payments to the victims and to charity, which were fully funded by insurance coverage. All the lawsuits were settled out of court before a trial occurred. Crown Center and Hallmark Corporation never admitted any wrongdoing for their involvement in the Hyatt Regency disaster. So I mentioned a different take on this tragedy. In the last few years, there have been two major books published about the Hyatt disaster. One was written by Richard Serrano, who was a reporter for the Kansas City Times newspaper, 
At the time of the disaster, there were two papers published each day by the local paper. The Kansas City Times, which was the morning paper, and the Kansas City Star, which was the afternoon paper. They each had independently operated investigative teams who reported on the disaster and they quickly became the voice of Kansas City in their coverage seeking to explain who did what and when to cause this disaster. The other book, which was published earlier this year, was written by R. Eli Paul, who had been contacted by the son of Robert Gordon to review the voluminous amount of records that were left about the Hyatt disaster following the death of attorney Richard Gordon from colon cancer in 2008. Robert Gordon worked tirelessly and by all accounts obsessively on behalf of the plaintiffs who were suing Hallmark and others for their role in the disaster as part of a class action federal lawsuit. Gordon's near total obsession with trying to bring this suit to trial and expose those who he thought were the main culprits of the disaster, namely the executives at Hallmark Cards, led to the ruin of his legal career and his family life. Both books gave very poignant accounts of the people who were killed and injured at the Hyatt tragedy. I'm not going to describe these horrific injuries that were suffered by the victims. However, you can just imagine what would happen if 60 tons of steel, concrete, glass, and a wallboard came crashing to the ground while smashing hundreds of people in the process. But the main thrust of the Skywalks book was to bring to publication some version of the book that Robert Gordon had worked on for years but was never able to successfully publish. Gordon's central premise was that the management at Hallmark and Crown Center Redevelopment Corporation, and primarily the management decisions made by their CEO, Don Hall, in his role as developer of the Hyatt Regency Project, directly created the conditions for this disaster to occur. Don Hall's main focus reportedly was to get the hotel built within budget and on time. In order to fast track the hotel construction, building design occurred as the hotel was being built. Don Hall became CEO of Hallmark Cards in 1966. In the 1970s, he approached Kansas City officials who ultimately approved his plan for a mixed-use development in the area between Westport and downtown Kansas City, between Gillum and Main Streets, and between 22nd and 27th Streets. This approximately 80-acre area was known as Signboard Hill. This area had become run down and a major eyesore for the city that was trying to shake its image as a cow town that was later run by mobsters. The signature part of this redevelopment project would be to construct and own the 45-story, 733-room Hyatt Regency Hotel. The Hyatt Corporation would only operate the hotel under a license agreement with Crown Center Redevelopment Corporation, which was a company created by Hallmark Cards. Since 2011, the hotel has been operated as the Sheridan Crown Center. Hotel construction was completed in 1980, and there were several disasters and near disasters during the construction of the Hyatt Regency. In 1979, a young worker, Paul Noll Jr., who is a worker for the prime contractor Eldridge and Sons, was killed on the ground after being struck from a falling beam. Ten days before Nold's death, tons of steel and concrete associated with roof panels for the atrium collapsed and fell to the lobby level. Over 2,700 square feet of roof area collapsed. Fortunately, this happened in the middle of the night. Had this happened during construction, or even worse, after the hotel had opened, it would have killed dozens if not hundreds of people. The collapse of the roof led to a lot of internal discussions about the overall safety of the hotel's construction. But in retrospect, this event did not result in discovery of the problems with the Skywalk support system. Now I think it's time to lay out the key facts that would suggest significant culpability with the non-engineer players on this project and how the Skywalk tragedy occurred. First, let's consider the collapse of the atrium roof where over 30 tons of steel and concrete crashed from a height of over 50 feet from the roof to the floor level. Crown Center officials reportedly misled Kansas City building officials by suggesting that only a single beam had fallen. Such misleading efforts were apparently easy to make since the entire time spent by Kansas City building inspectors on site during the two and a half year construction period of the Hyatt Regency Hotel totaled less than 19 hours. Subsequent investigations showed that many of the connector plates for the roof panels were missing at the time of the roof collapse. Crown Center paid for an independent engineering team to evaluate the construction and their investigation only involved a few spot checks of the skywalks. The firm was limited by Crown Center to a total fee of $5,000 to conduct their inspections. Crown Center apparently had enough concern about the safety of the skywalks such that they retrofitted access panels to permit inspection of the anchor rod and box beam connections. However, these panels were never used for inspections and there were no arrangements made with Hyatt management or others for these inspections to occur. Following the atrium roof collapse, Crown Center promptly purchased an additional $200 million in liability coverage on the hotel a policy that reportedly did not exclude payments for punitive damages. Gillen's firm had proposed that they perform full-time inspection of the hotel's construction following collapse of the atrium roof, but this did not occur as Crown Center reportedly did not want to spend the money for such services. 
Unfortunately for Gillum and his firm, he continued to render design services for the hotel, even though they would not be on site to perform important verification and inspection of the structural work for the hotel. This is surprising to me, considering that Gillum saw evidence of extensive, poor quality building construction following the collapse of the roof. Another key issue is the contractor selected by Crown Center for construction of the hotel, Eldridge & Son, was facing bankruptcy prior to completion of the Hyatt Regency. They were only kept afloat through cash infusions from Crown Center. It's been suggested that Crown Center and Hallmark kept Eldridge afloat in order to create another buffer against liability associated with the hotel's construction due to suspected or possibly known defects. Another interesting aspect that was reported was that apparently Crown Center had tried to get the Hyatt Corporation to buy an ownership stake in the hotel prior to its completion. However, Hyatt Corporation declined. Once the Skywalks collapse occurred at the Hyatt Regency Hotel, Hallmark and their lawyers pursued a rigorous plan to avoid incurring liability and to try to settle most, if not all, the lawsuits prior to the commencement of a trial. According to attorney Robert Gordon, Crown Centers, Don Hall, and other executives perjured themselves in their depositions by claiming that they could not recall key aspects of their decision-making throughout the hotel construction process. Tape recordings and meeting minutes associated with key project management meetings later were discovered that made it clear that those involved in construction management of the Hyatt Regency had discussed serious design and safety issues about the hotel, particularly following the collapse of the atrium roof. Gordon further alleged that Crown Center and Hallmark Corporation flaunted discovery requirements and would typically dump huge volumes of documents right at the time of proceedings. It was reported that Don Hall was in a big hurry to get the Hyatt Regency cleaned up, repaired, and back open as soon as possible after the Skywalks collapse. They spent a total of $5 million in this effort, and they quietly reopened the hotel in October 1981, a little over two months after the disaster. This raised a lot of concerns because the investigations as to what caused the collapse of the Skywalks had not yet been completed. It was also reported that Don Hall ordered the midnight removal of debris associated with the collapse of the Skywalks. Another midnight removal occurred of the still intact third floor Skywalk, much to the frustration of investigators and city officials who planned to do on-site inspections and load tests as part of their investigations. At the time, the Skywalk investigation was led by the National Bureau of Standards, now called NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. In the early days of the federal investigation, Crown Center barred the investigators from having access to the Skywalk debris. Federal officials ultimately did an extensive investigation, but unfortunately, in my opinion, they steadfastly refused to assess blame or determine to what extent project management decisions led to the disaster. NIST is currently investigating the Champlain Tower condominium collapse in Surfside, Florida, However, I don't expect them to really get into who did what and when that led to the collapse of that building and the deaths of 98 people. You know, these government agencies inevitably become politicized by avoiding making judgments about any lapses in key decision making. However, engineering and construction management are well-established technical fields that could definitely benefit from more broadly based federal investigations associated with such disasters. Hallmark and Crown Center Redevelopment went to great lengths to undermine the viability of the class action lawsuits by aggressively pursuing settlements with survivors and family members of those killed in the disaster. This is perhaps understandable since this is how modern U.S. corporations operate to insulate themselves from liability and to avoid impacts on their profits. However, it creates a situation that is far from morally or ethically satisfying. To further reduce the pool of potential litigants at trial and the resulting punitive damages, Hallmark's lead attorney originated the idea of offering $1,000 to anyone who had been at the hotel but who had not suffered any physical injuries. Approximately 800 people took this settlement money in exchange for releasing Hallmark and Crown Center from any future liability claims. The whole scheme was a relatively cheap way of avoiding large punitive damages at trial and to reduce the number of plaintiffs involved in the class action lawsuit. If the number of litigants in the class action suit had dropped to a low enough level, they could no longer get class action status. Hallmark and their executives were acutely aware that the collapse of the Skywalks that resulted in so many deaths and injuries ran counter to their wholesome family image that they had spent decades cultivating. Hallmark was also one of the largest private employers in Kansas City at the time, so to say that there was a lack of resolve among most local government officials to hold the non-engineer project managers associated with Hallmark and Crown Center to account would be a vast understatement. In fact, instead of maximizing payments to victims and their families, Hallmark and Crown Center paid $3.5 million to victims, but then paid another $6.5 million to Kansas City area charities as part of the overall settlement agreement. Total payouts coming from completely insured sources was only about $150 million, which is just under $500 million today. 
If such a disaster were to occur today, the total settlement amount would likely be in the billions of dollars. Many survivors and first responders dealt with lifelong mental anguish and post-traumatic stress disorder from their traumas and witnessing the aftermath of the Skywalk collapse. These non-visible impacts to people were largely dismissed by the defendants and their attorneys in the Hyatt collapse claims. So let's circle back. The engineers involved were appropriately sanctioned, in my opinion, by the Missouri Board of Architects and Engineers following a lengthy investigation and hearings. To me, it seems that these engineers no doubt suffered greatly for their mistakes on this project, both personally and professionally. But Hallmark and Crown Center executives, particularly their CEO at the time, Don Hall, never publicly acknowledged their own mistake in the lead up to the disaster and its aftermath. Don Hall is currently alive at the age of 95. Hallmark and Crown Center issued this statement according to Fox 4 News following the damning allegations against them in the Skywalks book that was published earlier this year, 2023. It has been nearly 42 years since the tragedy at the Hyatt Regency and 40 years since the related litigation was resolved, and we have never forgotten the victims and their families. All three judicial authorities that reviewed the matter concluded the engineer's design of the Skywalks was to blame. We reject any narrative that is inconsistent with the facts, findings, and the legal record. You know, what occurs to me is that two things can be true at the same time. The first was that the engineers who should have known better had serious lapses in completing their design work and having it implemented during construction. The other thing that can also be true is that the project management decisions associated with Hallmark Cards and Crown Center redevelopment created an atmosphere where cost cutting and substandard construction methods and materials were used to build the hotel as quickly as possible. Also, serious warnings about the safety of the Hyatt building were not adequately or fully investigated, particularly after serious developments like the atrium roof collapse occurred. There's a lesson here because it's the design professionals who will generally be held accountable for such disasters when few, if any others, will. Changes in building codes and statutory requirements have since clarified the ultimate responsibility for the design and construction of buildings by the engineer of record. What I personally remember learning about the lessons of the Hyatt as I entered engineering practice in the late 1980s was to only engage in work that I was qualified to perform. For work done by me or under my direct supervision, I would be responsible for carefully executing and reviewing my work. To the extent that I made any assumptions about conditions related to calculations and design, that I would clearly communicate with others involved in the project what my assumptions were and why I made them. Another important lesson that I learned when I became an engineering manager and later owner of my own geotechnical engineering firm was to carefully select who I was willing to provide services to and under what conditions I would provide such services. For example, I've had contractors ask me to perform slope stability calculations prior to their excavating a slope for, say, a bridge abutment. I insisted on including in my scope of services sufficient time and fees to perform site observation services to confirm my assumptions about the nature of the material in the slope and their sequence of construction. It really baffles me that some engineering consultants would accept limited fees for design services without insisting on being paid for construction phase observations on projects involving, say, slopes, braced excavations, retaining walls, just to cite a few examples. As a result, the engineering firm's risk exposure on such projects becomes large and disproportionate relative to that of others on the project. I really wish that the recent books about the Hyatt disaster had been published years ago. If this had happened, maybe the management of Hallmark Cards and Crown Center Redevelopment Corporation would have had to answer for their involvement in the Hyatt tragedy. Check out the link in the description for this video to download your free copy of my guide to the top civil engineering disasters of the last 100 years. Thanks for watching everyone and please stay tuned for future videos.